Okay, our next and last speaker for the day is Professor Andreas Merker. Professor Merker is a clinical psychologist and an international expert in traumatic stress-related mental disorders. He also contributed to lifespan and sociocultural aspects of trauma sequel. Professor Merker received his doctorate from Humboldt University in Berlin in 1986. I'll give you a, another century in medicine and a year later in, psycho in, in psychology. He is a specialist in psychosomatic medicine and psychotherapy, and he has held other professional posi positions in San Francisco, Zurich, and Trier. And since two 2005, he is the head of the department at the University of Zurich in the Psychotherapeutic Center of the Psychological Institute. He heads the Department of General Psychotherapy. Professor Merger was awarded in uh, 2017 the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany in recognition of his scientific work and working in honorary capacity in psychotraumatology and the clinical care of traumatized persons. And in the same year, the Walter de Luce Award for Distinguished Contribution to Psychotraumatology in Europe from the European Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, the ESTSS. International contribution of his work in PTSD include the development of assessments of socio-interpersonal risk and protective factors. Based on these factors, he developed the social interpersonal model of PTSD about which we will hear now. Professor Merker, please. I'm so excited to be here and grateful, grateful to Sahava for the long time we were in contact, we are still in contact and I'm yeah, really happy to contribute to your honorary conference and I'm grateful to you, uh, Rachel and uh, Kani for organizing and for inviting and for setting the topic of my talk, which I have to uh, look for. Um, I will oops, uh, try to get out of the previous presentation. Yeah, thank you. So you will find on my first slide somebody in a state of spreading out contagion um, as a, let, let's say, a symbol of uh, trauma. But I, I would like to, yeah, I'm the last speaker of today, um, not, uh, do, do it not in the, in the manner the previous speaker uh, did it, uh, to tell you about kind of a hard science and its results. I would like to do it in a more personal journey type um, and hope this will inspire you somehow uh, and not um, only learning about results and research projects. Partly it's because uh, I have to tell you things that are not researched now and I would like to invite you and your team and you yourself to, um, to look if these uh, kind of issues and topics are interesting for future research. I wanted in addition to say I feel we have a kind of a secure attachment. <laughs> Sahaba, we, we didn't meet every year, we didn't email every half year, but over the years and decades, it's a long time, uh, it feels very secure and, and prevents from all kinds of, of, of um, um, bad stress effects. I begin with um, some person, first encounters. Oh, actually, uh, the, the movements are lost in my slide now. You already get the whole picture. I wanted to... Um, partly uh, develop the presentation here. 
Um, I was deeply impressed in the early 1990s with Tahava's work on prisoners of war. Uh, it had been cited here, and I don't have uh, to add on it. And of course, then in a book, and her second book, um, she edited on her work on Holocaust survivor in the first Gulf War. This kind of related to what I was trying to build up at these years in the early 1919s when we did research on former political prisoners from, um, from East Germany, the former German Democratic Republic. And um, the um, commonality was kind of with the prisoners of war and these prisoners were the torture they suffered. And um, this was, uh, I learned a lot of, of your research with this respect. But the second aspect, uh, work on Holocaust survivors in the second, um, in the first Gulf War, was then in addition, uh, an input, and very important input to the lifespan developmental uh, psychology aspect of, of trauma sequelae. And we had a conference, and I was so happy to have you at this conference um, close to the River Elbe, not in one of these um, buildings, but one of the buildings had been the hotel you were uh, hosted at that time. And the outcome, one outcome of this small conference was um, a, a book, you already see it here, on post-traumatic stress disorder, a lifespan developmental perspective, where actually Carney and Rachel, you contributed as well, which is kind of a feeling of a family now uh, after more than 20 years. More than 20 years. Actually, the, um, the, the front turned back into an uglier one. I wanted to change it in, in the break. It, it worked, but now it's returned. Now you find this more as a not as nice to read font over here. I was deeply impressed um, with Zahava's work and the personal words she usually um, provides in oral presentations, but also in a book, in, in her book. And you find two quotes here from her uh, second book, Coping with War and Used Stress. And the Gulf War was the sixth year um, I experienced, the sixth war I experienced in my 41 years, while waiting at the base, worrying about my mother and my kids, and generally being at loose ends, it was hard for me to avoid the thought that the Gulf War offered me an opportunity to study the psychological reactions of people. The research I carried out during the rest of the war was my way to coping with the uncertainties of these days. And I think we need such statements in our field, in particular in the field of traumatic stress studies. And then the second quote, the idea for the study came to me when I was sitting with my mother, a survivor of Auschwitz, in a sealed room. Was my mother's intense distress idiosyncratic or did other Holocaust survivors share it? Again, I think these are the kind of disclosures we as scientists sometimes need to do to our, um, to our fellows. Yeah. I was invited by Carney and Rachel to talk about contagion. What did I know about contagion? It makes a lot of sense. Uh, I found very soon um, there is a, a literature on, um, on emotional contagion, very impressive one. But yeah, what my group did in the last decades was more in a broader sense, therefore I agreed with, with this title. But there's a narrower sense, and as you can read here, um, emotional contagion in a, in a, in a closer sense, in a, in, a, in a more focused sense, is a mimicry of facial expression, the basis of empathy, and therefore it's not by incident that we heard today something about empathy. And social contagion, the, the term I introduced in, in the title, um, is researched as imitated social behaviors. In, and actually this goes back to, as if I'm not wrong, to educational psychology, when these imitated social behaviors are mostly bad behaviors and problematic behaviors. 
In a broader sense, um, it's what we just learned and just impressively saw by, my by the previous speaker, a sustained influence on emotional state of others. For example, secondary traumatization and social contagion, the term I added, in a broader sense, may be sustained influences on social patterns, values, and axioms I would like to get uh, to in a minute. I would have loved to talk about other issues as well. For example, something we did in, um, in, the, in, the, in the past 20 years as well on, on um, um, therapeutic life review would be probably a proper occasion today to do something on life review um, in the context of trauma. Um, but um, I, um, and other things, for example, post-traumatic growth or, or the, actually for eight years I was um, mainly employed with um, topics at WHO on, on further development of the family of disorders specifically associated with stress, as it is called in ICD-11, trauma and prolonged grief disorder, prolonged grief disorder, at least should be mentioned here at this conference one time, and um, other important things like complex post-traumatic stress disorder. But, you know, now this is the basis. I only have one uh, research finding, one particular research finding on, on emotional contagion. I'll show you in, a, in two minutes. But was, I took this opportunity to, how can I say, to, uh, to ally again with uh, Yul Sahava to uh, work on this, um, on this development, an increasing awareness of social interpersonal effects of traumatization. It began in the 1980s as a tiny movement of very few, and I think you were one of the very few here. And yeah, here I cite you um, uh, and the other uh, guys in the room uh, in one paper, Solomon Michelincha Hopfall, social support research. This was new. Then there was a, some research on interpersonal functioning in the 1990s, mainly in Vietnam veterans or emergency service workers. But still, this were kind of a tiny part of the um, research in, P in the PTSD area. Uh, I would regard personally, and I always refer to this meta-analysis by Chris Bruin, uh, who showed that from all the 20 factors um, that had been researched in other studies, one factor stood out as most important for maintaining PTSD over months, years, and even decades, and this is number one, lack of social support. Actually, I think this is still the key finding of, um, of the whole movement, I would like to say, of um, bringing more awareness into the social um, psychological research or, um, on the effects of traumatization. We then um, developed this model uh, I'd like to uh, show you in a minute. And now we have in the area some more interpersonal social paradigms. Uh, interpersonal, of course, attachment is, is an interpersonal one, but I always like to bring it together with social and interpersonal paradigms in the area. And I'm really glad to have this kind of plurality now of, of different paradigms in the area. Now, the only actually fitting um, um, result from our lab um, on um, uh, uh, emotional contagion, it's on empathy. But in a different way, if I got it right from, uh, compared to today's presentation, kind of empathy in the survivors, in the victims of potential traumatic events, of in people with PTSD. And we uh, followed a distinction uh, which is other authors do it differently between, let's say, less complex and 
higher complex em emphatic em abilities. First, contagion, as it is in the literature, here has the paradigms of yawning or laughing, which is very basic. Then in the midst, we have uh, what other people put here, the, the reading the mind in the eyes test as mind reading. And here the more complex. Um, and we chose at that time uh, in our uh, experiments, we showed a faux pas recognition, which is um, cross-culturally, of course, very uh, rich area of research. Uh, if the faux pas um, in other countries are, uh, for example, are well known, but you have it sometimes in your own, um, your own culture. Then we were able to uh, do uh, some experiments with um, a group of, uh, in this case, which was methodologically not the best way, um, of a mixed group of uh, uh, full-blown PTSD patients compared to healthy controls, non-traumatized healthy controls. And what did we find? we found that there were strong differences, highly significant differences, that these basic abilities of empathy were kind of lacking, almost lacking in our PTSD subjects, which was very, let's say, informative and sad, but this was one of our results, but here are the others. The reading the mind in the eyes test, very often used in empathy research, came up with a non-significant finding. And uh, traditionally, I would say non-significant means no difference. The same group had no difference in this reading the mind in the eyes test. And the faux pas test, non-significant at all, meaning, and we interpret it at, at this way, that for higher or for more complex empathic abilities, there was no difference between um, um, people with PTSD and healthy controls. Only with the more basic ones, which, uh, which are closer to attention and probably to attentional problems, concentration problems, but when other cognitive abilities come in into empathy, then no difference, which creates a lot of question. What are our PTSD survivors have to compensate and, and successfully compensate uh, all their life? Actually, this piece of evidence, this, this ongoing compensation for, for, for basic um, mental defic uh, deficiencies went into ICD-11. Now you will find it um, uh, at some disorder definitions, for example, PTSD, that we have to acknowledge this ongoing performance of people with PTSD to, uh, um, to sustain their cognitive, emotional, and other abilities. So this is the only direct finding uh, to empathy. Uh, to contagion um, because of yawning and, and laughing. Here is an ugly looking uh, model. Um, it is a box, uh, boxological model. Um, but we didn't find another solution that time. Now we have some other solution, but then it's always more, more simple. Um, I wanted to bring in together with Andrea Horn that we should look in um, um, in addition to what the, our friends and colleagues do in, in memory research, uh, be it cognitive or biological, in, in PTSD area, social effects, mm -hmm. they count for maintaining PTSD, social end effects in the affected individual and in the others. And I would say this, there is a, let's say, a crossover effect or contagion effect, or how you call it, from the, the uh, affected individual to the others. The same here, we were looking for most telling and most important constructs for a close relationship, and empathy plays a role 
in a, in a let's say, in a, in a um, loving relationship, disclosure, as we heard today, and rumination, a term which had not been uh, mentioned today. And again, it may well be that there are differences in, or empathy I showed you, in the, con in the traumatized individual, but this may spread out to others. And the same is here. There are, let's say, concerning the ind traumatized individual and his closest group, there are changes in collectivism, value orientations, conflict resolution, resolutions. But this, in traumatized groups or individuals, spreads out to others. And therefore, the outcomes are on an individual level, on a relationship level, on an integration, societal integration level. And we, for example, try to cover with this uh, framework model also problems of societal integration after trauma. Uh, sorry, uh, I... Uh, this is, I wanted to have it in another font, as I already told you. This is a slide on the predictions of these social interpersonal models on the social affect level. Um, and I put here this, on, this, on, on this level, trauma, trauma effect induces sentiments of in close others. And um, the Concepts here are shame, guilt, anger, vanigans, paralysis of toxic shame and self-diminishment. And I cannot put here empirical evidence, but I take it from my clinical experiences that um, this paralysis in a family where a trauma happened is so apparent, it's so impressive and it's so devastating. Sometimes you have the feeling that they are fully stricken by shame, that they are, as shameful people do it, they can't, can't look uh, straight in, in, in one's eyes. And this is not only with the primary victim of, of a trauma, it's with the whole family. It's a kind of a... Um, paralyzes um, and it is so, um, yeah, for example, if, if you are confronted with it as a therapist, then secondary traumatization is even stronger if you, if you see not only the victim but also his closest social network in this way. For guilt, I would say the, the, it in, sometimes induces the feeling of inadequacy of support or helplessness of the close others. They can't assist. They see the loneliness uh, feelings of the traumatized person. They want to help, but they can't. This is very important for the family system as well. With anger, anger sometimes kind of gets um, taken over by other family members and they then like to act out or, or, um, and, and express the anger. Sometimes um, they, only they do it, not, not the victim. Sometimes both, part, uh, both parts do it. And they sometimes adapt an impulsive mode. And then you have a family system or a net close network system full of anger and impulsive, um, let's, let's call it overkill or so. And revenge and venegans. We did uh, some work on revenge, and I think it's still under-researched um, in the trauma field because it's so widespread, it's so common with uh, trauma victims, with people with PTSD. And we found examples that um, family members took over an imaginal task of revenge and acting on behalf of the victims. And this is all very moving and um, is one of the um, of the effects, of the middle-range middle effects of trauma. Actually, 
our group didn't research this, we only predicted it. Probably in the next 15 years we can do so, and by support of your group, Sava. So, now I'm getting to the other level, to the, um, the, the pre uh, predictions of uh, other levels of uh, close relationships. And I um, uh, chose uh, dysfunctional disclosure as well as, uh, no, sorry, that's, um, as well you will find here rumination, co-rumination. This should be a sign of co-rumination. We once um, developed um, an assessment for dysfunctional disclosure because it is in particular important for, for PTSD. Um, uh, individuals, reluctance to talk, urge to talk, and concomitant emotional reaction. And we were able to uh, did, do research in diets of, of, of a victim and a caregiver with traumatic brain injury uh, victims and what was interesting and adds something f to your research, although we were only looking for main effect, not for interactive effects, that um, the, the PTSD in the victims was predicted by own and caregiver's disclosure. The styles of, of disclosure or, or the, the, the extent of disclosure was predictive on how the uh, victims felt. The secondary PTSD in the caregivers was only predicted by the victims. And I don't have the time to, to speculate or to interpret these results, but we found it very interesting that in the primary victims, both are contributing to the extent of PTSD. Co-rumination, I would say it's an under-researched um, um, topic or, or paradigm as well. This is, uh, contains uh, questions like why did it happen? Why did it happen to me, to him, to her? It, uh, it entails uh, circular thoughts and negative interpretations. You can imagine as something that two persons are always talking to each other, but it doesn't create any solution for this um, traumatized um, couple or, or the diet. And we did research in, uh, actually in Belarus by a doctoral student who joined us for three years or for more than one year. Um, and it was with traumatized emergency personnel. And we found for this uh, new paradigm, I would say, actually it had been developed in developmental psychology, we find medium to high associations with PTSD and, in addition, uh, medium association to post-traumatic growth. The last level, the predictions of the models on the societal level, I only focus on increased traditional value orientations. We learned a lot from the Israel social psychologist uh, Shalom Schwartz, and this gave us a matrix for, 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 how can I say, assessing changes on a societal level. And yeah, trauma, PTSD, um, somehow um, increases in traditional values. It, uh, this is, first year, this is a prediction. It, uh, in, in the category of conformity, it, um, it um, predicts passivity, passiv passivity, expectations of dependency and fatalism in customs orientation, a general mistrust to new things. And then, very interesting, but I don't have time to get to in, uh, superficial or short-term goals. And with regard to security, one of these uh, traditional values, exclusion, seclusion, suspicion. I would say there is uh, evidence. We once had the opportunity to have in a secondary data analysis to look in 13 um, um, European countries for death toll in wars and their 
profile of the Shalom Schwartz's uh, value matrix. And we found that higher death toll in wars was correlated with more or inc no, with higher traditional values, which was very, very impressive. Small sample, 13 countries where we had both. But another thing, another source is from um, Sri Lanka, from uh, our, my esteemed colleague um, uh, Samara Sundaram, who in a very careful qualitative study on societal aftermath of Sri Lanka's civil war, described the same. Without knowing Sholom Schwartz's uh, value metrics, he described in his book, Scared Communities, just these phenomena on, on societal changes. My last slide will be on, not on nothing, but on fatalism, um, <laughs> um, and an ongoing research project, um, fatalism. We regard fatalism as more widespread than we often think because we are here in an academic environment and many of us are highly educated. Yeah, it's a general belief of submission to predetermination, but not only. Actually, I should extend it, uh, this definition to uh, it's, it brings in the constraints of, uh, that determine our options in life. And we all live in constraints. And there is an awareness of constraints. And actually, we are still working on, on this uh, research program on fatalism. It's not only in traditional societies. It's also in societies. Um, and we don't know only in their traditional parts or in parts where people are aware of the constraints that fatalism is around. We found this is not so easy to work on fatalism without proper cross-cultural methodolog uh, methodology. Uh, and therefore, we had um, in some countries we um, already um, analyzed, we found kind of a more neutral fatalism or negative fatalism, and a second a negative or pessimistic fatalism, which is something different. And in other countries, we found, interestingly, a more explanatory fatalism and an anticipatory fatalism. And therefore, as uh, this is a learning story uh, recently, you can't apply these constructs around the world without uh, looking closer into the use at this uh, particular culture. But I'm getting to my end. I would say. Fatalism is one main source of not reaching, not, not seeking help um, uh, of our clients or of our non-clients because in parts of our societies there are so many um, people who are traumatized who have PTSD but they don't look for uh, any kind of support or therapy. Therefore, I'd like to end with some ideas of antagonists of fatalism, taking responsibility, perceive oneself as a part of the social organism, which is, I would say, apparent, but sometimes less um, acknowledged, to perceive oneself as an active part of this social organism, and if necessary, seek help. This is only to show you that um, the idea of, um, of uh, Carney and Rachel is already in the media. Fatalism is contagious. Um, so this is my thank uh, to Sahaba. And I would, yeah. I join you in applauding Sahaba and hope you will, um, will continue to work with us. Thank you very much.